What makes food addictive? And what are the most important things you need to do right now to lower your risk of developing addictions to certain types of foods? Before we jump into all of the interesting facts and details and data on this important topic, please go ahead and hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and I would love to hear your comments on this topic. Now, we all know obesity is an epidemic, but one of the things that's really concerning is, is what the projections are. It's projected that by 2030, 85% of the adults are projected to be overweight or obese. Just think about that for a minute, 85%. That's despite all of the nutrition programs, all of the diets, all of the struggles that people have had, we have not been able to make a dent in the crisis that's coming and the crisis that continues to increase healthcare costs. In fact, the projections are for healthcare costs related to obesity to increase by 15% over the next 15 years. Now, when we think about weight, it's important to realize that 20 to 30% of a lot of who we are is genetic. The rest of it is based on a number of factors. And a portion of that is the environment. But really, when you think about the causes of obesity that are environmental related, it has to do with the access to food. What kind of foods are easy to access? It has to do with the portion sizes as they've gotten larger and larger. Even though people feel that they're eating lower fat as a percentage, they're eating more calories from fat than they've done ever before. There's less physical activity and we have this advent of really highly addictive foods and that's the topic for today. So what is food addiction? Essentially, the definition for it is this loss of control over eating. People feel like they're unable to stop despite the fact that they're still having negative consequences. That may be diabetes, heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, and yet they can't give up those sugary, those high fat foods. So this is why when we talk about food addiction, we say that addiction to food is very similar to addiction to drugs. And the reason for that statement is because the reward pathways in both of them are very similar. So when animals get fed junk food or drugs, the same sort of pathways occur. There's overstimulation of those pathways, then this is a bit of neural adaptation where those reward pathways, they actually downregulate or they decrease. So what ends up happening is, is those animals, and in our case, humans, we want to consume those kinds of foods over and over again. We want to get that stimulation, that constant activity of those pathways so that we don't have to experience the withdrawals. This concept of food addiction is so strong that in rats, when they're fed, highly addictive foods, which are rich in refined carbohydrates and fat, not only do they gain weight, they actually have this tendency to want to keep eating despite the fact that they may be full and despite the fact that they may know for sure that they're going to get a shock. So these experiments, unfortunately, are done with animals where the animals are designed to go for this food, but they know every time they try to eat that high fat, high carbohydrate food, they're going to get shocked and yet they keep doing it. And if you take that highly processed fat and carbohydrate rich food away and you try to give them healthy food, the rats actually refuse to eat and they end up starving themselves. And this is the same concept in humans is we are so addicted to this food that we quit going after it. The only difference here is because we have such easy access to these foods, there's really no reason for us to change. So when we look at food addiction, the way we measure it, we use something known as a Yale food addiction scale. It's basically a 25 item scale that is basically built around the DSM-4 criteria for substance abuse. And it helps us to quantify those addictive eating symptoms. And essentially, these addictive foods that we're talking about, they have a lot of things that are very simple. First, the characteristic that they have is the foods are rarely ever in their natural state. So think of grapes, which are not addictive, versus wine, which is once again processed into forming wine. Flip that around, you can think of foods such as fruits, which have sugar, or nuts, which have fat. They're not addictive by themselves, but you take processed foods like cake, pizza, chocolate, that are rich in carbohydrates and fat, and they have high amounts of fat and sugar, and they're highly addictive. So this take-home message here really is this. The environment you're in, the access to food you have matters. So if you find yourself having junk food in the home, you're going to eat. This is something that Chef AJ talks about a lot is she tells her clients and she tells everybody on her YouTube channel, you can't have it in the home. If you have it in the home, it's going to end up in your mouth. And I completely agree 
with that philosophy. Now, when we talk about addictive foods, one way to think about them is looking at something known as a glycemic index. There's glycemic load and there's glycemic index. What a glycemic index is very simply, it's just a rating on how slowly or quickly foods cause an increase in your blood sugars. There's low glycemic, medium or high, low is 55 or less, medium is about 56 to 69, and high is 70 or more. And examples of high glycemic index foods are things like white rice, white bread, and potatoes. Now, on the other hand, the flaw in glycemic index is the fact that it doesn't take into account serving size. So therefore, a glycemic index for one item can't be compared to another. But the glycemic load overcomes that by essentially looking at servings. So it takes the glycemic index and it also takes into account the typical serving size and calculates a glycemic load. Low is less than 10, medium is 11 to 19, and high is greater than 20. So typical glycemic loads of foods that are high glycemic load, meaning greater than 20, are things like raisins, um, Snickers candy bar, jelly beans, or cornflakes, versus on the flip side, low glycemic load, once again, peanuts, watermelons, kidney beans, all brand cereal, etc. Let's get into the study. So in this study, they actually had two parts. In the first part, they looked at 120 undergrads, ages 18 to 21. The majority were Caucasians, and they had them answer 25 questions on the Yale Food Addiction Scale, essentially asking how often did they have problems with certain foods. And what they found was that the most problematic foods are the ones that are the same that we've been talking about. Highest level of processing, highest amount of fat added, and the highest amount of refined carbohydrates. They were chocolate, ice cream, french fries, pizza, and cookie. On the flip side, the least problematic foods were things like beans, broccoli, cucumbers, water, brown rice. And once again, those least problematic foods were foods that are closest in their natural state. In the second part of the study, they had 389 participants, this time ages 18 to 65, 76.8% Caucasian. So once again, may not be relevant or applicable to the rest of ethnic populations. This time they asked them how likely were they to experience problems with each of these 35 foods that they presented them. And they use a Likert scale. So basically one was not problematic and seven was most problematic. And once again, the ones that were the most problematic, most addictive were pizza, chocolate, chips, cookies, ice cream, all of the foods that are highly processed, highest in fat, highest in refined carbohydrates. And the least addictive, the complete opposite, cucumbers, carrots, beans, apple, brown rice. So if you're watching this video, what is the take? Well, the first is even though food addiction is not officially a diagnosis in DSM-5, food addiction is very real. It is a huge problem and we have to recognize it and it is similar to drug addiction. And one of the best ways to minimize is by making sure you don't have those foods in your house. If you do that, you're less likely to consume them. Create barriers, make it harder for you to get that food. If it means going out for fast food, wait 30 minutes. Dr. Columbus Batiste talked about this idea in one of the videos we did where he said, you can have the food that you want, you just have to wait 30 minutes. And in that 30 minutes, you just have to eat something healthy like an apple. And then at the end of 30 minutes, if you feel like having it, go for it. I think that's brilliant. Number two, realize that people with food addiction, they experience a loss of control. And it's hard for them to be able to give that up despite having negative consequences. So what we can do to help them is to make the distance between them and the foods that are addictive as big as possible. The harder it is to get those foods, the less likely they are to have those foods. And the easier it is to have the healthier choices, the more likely they are to have it. And then remember, the highest processed foods, the ones with the highest amount of added fats and sugars, are the ones that are the most addictive. And if you want to know how to be able to switch away from this, a whole foods, plant-based diet is ideal because it's naturally low in fat, it's naturally low in refined carbohydrates. It is incredibly nutritious for you. It's good for the planet. It's good for your overall health. And it's good for the health of our children. I want to thank you so much for watching. And please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. I would love to hear your comments. And I'll see you next time.